In this video, it is time to step away from trees and to go into a little bit of semantics that interacts very nicely with our syntax, and that is the concept of theta roles. So I have two sentences below, and they're grammatically okay, but they're semantically weird. For instance, my notebook climbed the ladder. There's something weird about this, and the thing that's weird is that typically notebooks don't climb ladders. Books put John in a margarine magazine. This is also weird because typically books don't put places somewhere. Uh, you can put people in places and you can put them into things. Like I could put a bookmarker in a margarine magazine, that's fine. But it's weird to put a person into a piece of paper, right? Yeah. So <laughs> what do we do about this? What are these theta rules that we have to talk about in order to make these sentences better? Well, let's introduce these. These are semantic categories that we can put determiner phrases and some prepositional phrases into. The first one are agents. Agents are initiators or doers of an action. For instance, in the sentence, John hit Jack, John is the one initiating the hitting. He is the one doing the hitting. John is the agent of the sentence. Stephen jumped off the cliff. Okay, well, jumped is a verb, and a jumper has to be someone who does something. So Stephen has to initiate the jumping. Stephen has to be doing the jumping. Okay, so Stephen is the agent of our sentence. Let's look back at the previous sentence. My notebook climbed a ladder. Well, climbed takes an agent. You have to climb. You have to physically climb. You have to be the doer of climbing. But notebooks can't be agents. Notebooks aren't sentient. That's where this sentence is going wrong. We need an agent for this, but the notebook is not a valid agent. That's one basic example. So those are agents, initiators or doers of an action. The second important theta role is the experiencer, and these are arguments that feel or perceive events. This is a little bit different than an agent, uh, but they're very easily confused with agents. So, Joss likes Shiba Inus. In this sentence, likes is a verb that takes an experiencer as a subject. And I just write that with EXP. Now, why isn't this an agent? Well, to like something, you don't actively initiate liking. It's a feeling, it's an experience, it is a perception of something. The fact that Joss likes Shiba Inus She's not doing it intentionally. It just happens to be the fact or happens to be the case that she likes Shiba Inus. Or what about this other sentence? Melanie saw the performance. Well, seeing isn't really something you do actively. It's something you do passively. You can passively see something. But let's compare this to looked at. What about Melanie looked at the performance? In this case, with the words looked at, we have an agent. Since the act of looking requires an initiator, you have to be the person doing it or initiating looking. While seeing, you can just be sitting back, laying down, and then suddenly the performance starts in front of you and you're not paying attention, but you're still seeing it. So that's the difference between an experiencer and an agent. Another example would be like, Melanie heard the performance, in which case heard takes an experiencer, because you don't have to be actively listening in order to hear something. Okay. That's the difference between agent and experiencer. The next really important thing is theme, and this is just a bundle of different descriptions, and the best way to learn a theme is to kind of just say, is it one of these? Is it one of these? Is it one of these? Oh, it's none of those? I guess it's a theme. Or take a look at a lot of examples and then try to figure out an abstract idea for what a theme is. The nice description are entities that undergo actions are moved, experienced, or perceived. In other words, they're the objects of the sentence. That's the best way to put it. Most of the time, theme is going to be an object. So the tigers ate the lamb. Okay, The lamb is the theme of the sentence. It is the thing being eaten. What about the tigers? The tigers are actively eating something. So the tiger is an agent. 
So agents eat themes. What about the, this key opens the door? Well, the door is just chilling there and then suddenly it's moved, it's, it's opened. So the key opens the door. Uh, this key, again, it's an agent. It's a little bit different of an agent. It's not a sentient agent, but the key is the one that is actively opening the door. Many people fear spiders. Okay. Uh, spiders, that's the theme. That's the thing being talked about. It is the thing that is being feared. So what about many people? Well, this isn't an agent. You can't actively fear something. This is a feeling that you perceive. Fear is a feeling. So many people in this case is an experiencer. But we can see in these transitive verbs, the tigers ate the lamb. This key opens the door. Many people fear spiders. It's always the object that is the theme. Okay, this is one of those trends that can help you learn which ones are themes. Typically, objects. In passive constructions, things might change a little bit, but we'll get there when we come to it. Another one is goal. I went to Disneyland. To Disneyland, this is the goal. That's where we want to go. It's an entity towards which motion takes place. Or I gave my love to Walt. Well, Walt is the receiver of the goal, or of, of the love. You know, you want to give your love to him. So the goal is to give the love to Walt. This is generally a pretty straightforward one that people don't have problems with. Uh, the key here that I note is that this is abstract. So I gave my love. You can't physically give love to somebody, but the abstract goal is to give the love to Walt. While I went to Disneyland, that's a very clear and concrete goal. It exists in real life. That's goal. Location is the place where an action occurs. We live in California. This is a location because the living is being done in California. This is not the goal because you're not going to California. No, the living is occurring in California. It is the location we're living. Ted killed the bystander in the park. This is a location. This is where the killing took place. So where the killing took place, where the living took place. These are locations. This is how it's different from a goal. Now that we have an idea of theta roles, and there are a few more, those were just the most important ones and the ones you typically use in trees, we can talk about theta grids. So verbs are either intransitive, transitive, or diatransitive. You can check out the second video in the series if you may have forgotten about that, which means that each verb takes either one, two, or three arguments. So this is a theta grid. Here's the theta grid for the verb put. This says, if we take a look at the bottom, there's three arguments for put, and it takes the form I put J K, or I put something somewhere. And in this theta grid, it takes a look at the requirements. So for example, I has to be the agent, and it takes a DP. So I could say something like Jeff put. And then the J argument, the second thing it takes is a theme determiner phrase. So Jeff put the book. Okay, that's a good theme. It is a thing being put somewhere. And then the third argument it takes is a goal prepositional phrase. So Jeff put the book maybe on the shelf. That's a pretty good prepositional phrase, which is also a goal. So we can see that this verb put with this theta grid, constructs proper sentences. Really, when we talk about sentences being ungrammatical or not, like for instance, if I were to say, I put the dog, and then you're saying, well, what happens to the rest of the sentence? Where is it? What we're actually saying is that the theta grid for put requires three arguments, and that in the sentence, I put the dog, we're missing this third argument, therefore it's ungrammatical. So we can see how theta grids can kind of tie in to syntax and semantics. Here's another one, eat, the transitive eat. Well, eat 
is a transitive verb. It takes the form I eat J. So the first thing it takes is an agent, DP. It takes an eater. So again, we can think of this as just the eater. And the second thing it takes is something being eaten, the theme DP or the eat E. In fact, we can take a look at this in predicate logic form. This isn't something I formally introduced, but if you watch the mathematical linguistic series, you will see this type of representation, so you can learn it there if you truly wish to. Um, and what this says is we just replace the first argument with Ben and the second argument with tacos, and then we get the sentence, Ben eats tacos. And I understand tacos, yes, lowercase. Okay, but we can see here that it does take an agent, and we have a DP agent, and it takes a DP theme for tacos. So we can construct sentences just looking at a theta grid. So let's talk about the theta criterion. The theta criterion states that each argument is assigned exactly one theta role. So for every DP in our sentence, it will get a theta role. And each theta role is assigned to exactly one argument. This means in one clause, you will not have two agents. You will not have two themes. You will not have two goals. You will just have one of each or one of however many you need. Let's take a look at these three sentences. And these are all bad sentences. Megan gave John. Well, we already talked what was a little bit weird about this with the word put. Megan gave John. We need something else. So gave is ditransitive. It takes three arguments. We can write this as gave I J K where someone gives something to someone. So here is our I argument. John is our J argument. And then we're missing the third argument, which is our K. So that is why this sentence is ungrammatical. What about Joan devoured? Well, devoured is a transitive verb. We'd write this as devoured I J, where it takes two arguments. It takes someone who devours something. So Joan is our agent the devourer, but it's missing the theme of the sentence. It needs a theme. The verb devour needs a theme, which is our J that we're missing. Okay. So we should have a theme here. Just like in the first sentence, we should have had um, John, Megan gave John something. So this would also be a theme that we're missing. Because John in this sentence is the goal. John, Megan gave something to John is another way to paraphrase that sentence. What about this third sentence? I sleep beds. Yeah, this one is also kind of bad. Why? Because sleep is intransitive. Sorry, this should be an I. So sleep takes one argument. It takes an experiencer. The problem here is that uh, we also have this theme here that we shouldn't have. So why do we have this theme in the sentence? We don't need a theme. Sleep cannot take another theme. It can't take a second argument. So we have some violations here. The first and second, well, there's no, th we're missing theta roles. So that's a violation. In the third example, we have too many theta roles. So that's another violation. Okay, that is theta roles and the theta criterion. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. I do have a couple more theta roles in my introduction to linguistic syntax video that you might want to check out if you do want to know them all. Uh, we never really use those ones, so that's why I've not included them in this video, but you can check that out. Um, it's on my channel, Introduction to Linguistics. It's either syntax one, two, or three. So if you have any questions, leave them below, and I'll answer them as soon as I can.